Hi everyone, welcome to the Recreating an Age of Reptiles book launch video. This is a book I've been working on for about a year now and a couple of days ago finally put it out there so you can actually go and buy this thing. What I've not really done so far is tell people what the book is uh, really about. I mean, I think people realize it's a book of paleo art, but I've not really spoken very much about the content or really what some of the, the sort of the themes are within the book. So I thought rather than writing this all out in a blog post, let's do something a little bit more, uh, more fancy and make a video of it. So let's dive in and have a bit of a discussion about what this book really contains. Recreating an Age of Reptiles is a print-on-demand paleo art book. So by print-on-demand, it means that you can only purchase it through the internet. You can't actually go to the shops and buy this thing. Um, we'll discuss that in a bit more detail later on. Um, what it contains is just over 90 scientifically credible paintings of the Mesozoic era. So the Mesozoic being the period of time from about 250 million years ago up to about 66 million years ago. And um, so yeah, it's got all these different pictures of all the different creatures that lived uh, in that interval and um, some discussion of the artwork and, the, and some of the science behind those paintings. If you follow me online, you'll know that I quite regularly, you know, put new artwork out on uh, on my Twitter feed, on my blog, and that sort of place. And you might be wondering, is it worth buying this book if you, you know, if you've followed me fairly closely over the, over the last few years? Uh, I hope the answer has to be yes, because about 20% of the art in recreating an age of reptiles is more or less brand new. So in some cases, I might have released a snippet of it. So you might have seen one or two animals from a bigger picture. You know, from a bigger composition where there's several animals in. Um, there are some bits of artwork that you will have never seen before anywhere else. And a lot of older, more familiar images, such as this Gonia folded it, have been updated and tidied up so they look a lot nicer than the previous versions that you may be familiar with. So I hope between these uh, three different ways of sort of updating or bringing new art to you, there's a good impetus to, to go out and, and grab a copy of, of the book. Now, we're not meant to judge books by their covers, but I do want to talk a little bit about the title of Recreating an Age of Reptiles uh, for several reasons. Um, the first is to really just make sure that everyone's okay with the fact it's called Recreating an Age of Reptiles. I've had some confusion come up on uh, Twitter and on, on the blog when I announced the title of the book, and people were saying, how can you call it Recreating an Age of Reptiles when it contains Mesozoic Dinosaurs? Mesozoic dinosaurs aren't reptiles, is, is you know, what people have been saying to me. Uh, this is a, a sort of an archaic way of looking at these animals, and we know they're far more bird-like than reptile-like now. Um, while that's true, you know, we certainly know that dinosaurs are very bird-like, um, the fact is that they're still reptiles. We appreciate that birds are reptiles as well. They're all in the reptile branch of the tetrapod tree. So there is really no reason not to call this book Recreating Age of Reptiles. And there are several other reasons for calling the book Recreating an Age of Reptiles as well. This is a, a term which has cropped up again and again throughout paleontological history, has a lot of reverence within paleo art, and uh, for reasons we'll, we'll discuss in a minute, has some personal significance as well. Uh, and just to give you, you know, some of the examples of, of why this is such a significant term, uh, within paleo art, one of the real masterworks of the discipline is Rudolf Zallinger's enormous mural, it's something like 30 meters long, painted on the, the side of the uh, the Hall of Reptiles in the Yale Peabody Museum. Um, this is a, a piece of work called The Age of Reptiles. So this is um, a term which ha has some precedent within paleo art itself. The term Age of Reptiles has significance within popular paleo media as well. And uh, for me, this has particular personal significance because it's the title of a comic series, which I, I was a great fan of as a child and still collect today. This is uh, Ricardo Delgado's Age of Reptiles comics. And many of you will probably be familiar with this already. If you've not come across this before, this is, uh, I guess, the kind of comic equivalent of a silent movie, but it stars Mesozoic animals. It stars, you know, pterosaurs and dinosaurs and all these sorts of things. And it just shows them doing sort of Mesozoic animal stuff. You know, they're, they're not there to uh, save the world or anything. They're just, just there to find food, uh, you know, find a, a partner to reproduce with, bring up some offspring and all this kind of stuff. Um, this was, as a nine-year-old, I first saw this one in 93 when it first came out. And um, this had a, a big impact on, on me. I think because uh, we didn't have much in the way of exposure to the Mesozoic back in, in 93. You know, the, the best things we had were sort of TV documentaries and, and films, which special effects being what they were at the time, only really offered very limited glimpses of dinosaurs and other Mesozoic animals 
doing their thing. So to find a whole comic series where you could read from beginning to end and just see these animals behaving in fairly naturalistic ways was a big deal for me. And uh, so using the term Age of Reptiles in the title of my book meant that I could sort of give a bit of an homage to something which was a, a, a you know, great inspiration for me as a, as a child. And the final reason to really use the term Age of Reptiles in the title of this book is because it would be a bit misleading to call it you know, the age of dinosaurs and other things because the book is, uh, I, I made, did my best to really make it as diverse as possible. So yeah, dinosaurs are in there, but a lot of the pictures in there aren't of dinosaurs. So to give you a bit of a tour about the sort of things you'll find, the book is uh, quite pterosaur heavy, number of different flying reptile species in there. We have uh, several pictures of early mammals and their sort of immediate ancestors. There is quite a lot of artwork of things which don't really have, you know, sort of easy classification in, in some respects. You know, these are things which are certainly reptiles, but they sort of plug, in, plug into parts of the tree that don't really have modern, um, you know, any representation in the modern day. So things like Tanistrophius, which kind of plug in somewhere between lizards and crocs, but, you know, they're not particularly closely related to either. And of course, dinosaurs do feature in the book, but they they don't uh, don't necessarily dominate. I think about fifty percent of the art does contain dinosaurs in uh, in one way or another. But um, there's no one group of dinosaurs that really overtakes the whole book. And um, as I say, you know, they are only a fraction of the animals compared to the, the rest of the, the uh, rest of the menagerie included in there. So hopefully, uh, Age of Reptiles is a, a a better descriptive term for the book's contents than rather em than, than emphasizing the dinosaur angle on its own. Because the book is fairly broad in its approach to depicting the Mesozoic, I can be fairly creative as to how I divided the book up into, you can't really call them chapters, they're not long enough to be chapters, but into different sections. And you can probably see the content screen on the page there if you're watching this in, in high enough resolution. And um, you get a sense of how the book's been divided up into um, taxonomic groups, into different animal behaviours, into different habitats, uh, and different parts of geological time. And um, within each of those sections, rather than just putting the pictures up and saying, here they are, I've tried to give a, some insight into how the pictures were actually created, you know, some of the science behind the decisions which were, uh, which informed the, the paintings, some of the artistic decisions that were made, and uh, if there's any interesting stories, you know, as goes collaborations with other scientists, then I've tried to put those in there as well. So this is actually a book which is, um, it's definitely art dominant, you know, there's, it's definitely a, a, an illustration book more than anything else, but um, it's not, you know, it's not devoid of text, you know, hopefully this is something that's worth reading as well as, as looking at. Now, I think the most important word in the title, Recreating an Age of Reptiles, is not actually the, the bits that you may imagine. I think the most important word in the title of this book is actually an, which might sound like a strange word to pick up on, but um, let me explain that, because I think this really does underline the sort of the themes of the book, you know, the things which come up again and again in the text. Um, I was born in the mid-1980s, uh, basically I've been interested in paleontology my entire life, and, uh, and particularly in artwork, you know, I was one of these kids who really liked looking at, at paleo art. But I found things very confusing you know, as, as I kind of became a little bit more uh, aware of what I was looking at and started to be able to compare people's pictures of you know, different, uh, different species and different animals. started noticing that there wasn't really much in the way of consistency in the depictions I was seeing. The books that I had as a kid were mixing, you know, old sort of historic pictures of these animals, like the Tyrannosauruses of Charles Knight and Zidnet Burian, with the more modern restorations of people like John Civic and Greg Paul, and then we had things like Jurassic Park coming out in the early 90s. And these were slightly confusing times uh, for, for a, you know, for a dinosaur-obsessed kid. What was going on in all of these pictures? And it left me, as I went into my teens, you know, wondering what was really going on in, in paleo art, you know, could we actually do this accurately at all? So it came as a, uh, something of a surprise to come across the work of Gregory S. Paul as a late teen and to find that he was a person saying that all these, all these kind of variations that we have in our artwork are incorrect, you know, we should be stamping them out and we should be depicting these animals in a far more uniform manner than we're used to seeing. Uh, there's a quote from Paul in a 1987 work which really 
you know, really struck home with, with me as a sort of an 18, 19 year old, which is that the common assertion that there is always more than one way to restore a given animal is not true. And that really, you know, that, that seemed incredible to me as, a, as someone who grew up with all these different pictures of dinosaurs. And of course, we still respect that, um, you know, what Paul said there was basically true, that the way that we restore fossil animals can be very heavily based in factual data, you know, can actually based, be based very closely on scientific evidence. And so, you know, we all know the basic route to paleoartistic restorations, I'm sure. We take the fossil data, we use that to build a basic skeletal reconstruction. You know, this gives us sort of our basic schematic for ideas of uh, musculature placement and, uh, you know, the, the basic outline of the animal. And we get then go on from there to produce our finished paleo artwork. Now, I think what we, you know, we're all basically happy with, with, with this basic, uh, basic process, but we have to acknowledge that there are several ways that we can introduce variation into our paleo art without leaving scientific credibility behind. The first way is that we have to acknowledge that there are huge gaps in the fossil record and that how we fill those gaps is not always, uh, is not always obvious and we can produce vastly different um, restorations of the same animal without it being wrong, if, if you know what I mean. You know, we can actually take some, uh, you know, take different types of fossil data, use those to fill in our, our, our gaps in anatomical knowledge or behavioral knowledge, and, um, and produce you know, very, very different life restorations without them actually being uh, you know, obviously flawed in any way to our existing data. The point here is that we are reconstructing hypotheses and interpretations of fossil data. We don't have a sort of universal truth. We don't come out, we don't find fossils in the ground and they have all the information that we need. We have to remember that we are extrapolating and interpreting um, the life appearance of those animals based on very limited data and that there is some wiggle room when it comes to how we approach the, the gaps and the unknowns in that data. The second source of variation in our artwork has to be the rather loose relationship between soft tissue anatomy and skeletal anatomy. Now, of course, folks like Paul have very correctly pointed out that actually we can be far tighter on things like restoring musculature than maybe people were in the past. And, you know, that's certainly still true today. I think what we're starting to realize now is that animals aren't just their musculoskeletal systems with skin thrown over the top. There's a lot more to it than that. And um, equally, when it comes to appreciating what animals actually did and how they behaved, not all of that information is available from their skeletons either. And so as artists, we have to, we have to wonder how far to push in different directions. You know, do, do we take the, uh, do we take a very conservative approach and just take the, the sort of the strictest, most de facto, um, approach to restoring these animals or do we be a little bit more speculative and of course these approaches were discussed at great length in the recent book by john conway and colleagues all yesterday's and if you haven't checked this book out um you really should you know if, you, if you're listening to this conversation and uh, you're interested in buying my book you definitely need to check out all yesterday's uh for what these guys are saying about speculation in paleo art it's a really important book for understanding paleo art in the 21st century and the third way that we introduce a lot of variation into our paleo art is through the different understandings that different artists have for how nature works. So as paleo artists, what we're really trying to do is restore ancient natural histories in, in art. And obviously, because we just can't copy them from the modern day, we have to apply our understanding of how nature really works. You know, how it is, it, do we view nature as one way or another way? Do we view nature as really sort of cruel and lean and ruthlessly efficient? Do we view nature as calm and serene and, you know, sort of whimsical? Uh, you know, and these can produce very different interpretations of exactly the same subject matter, you know, as we apply our different understandings of the natural world and the mechanics of the natural world to our paleo art. And you can see the kind of thing I'm talking about on the screen here. Obviously, these are both uh, examples of my own work showing a very different depiction of, uh, of Tyrannosaurus. We've got a rather whimsical restoration on the, on the left and a far more violent restoration on the right-hand side. If I expand this out to look at other people's restorations of Tyrannosaurus, 
on the one hand we'd have terrifically gory horrific pictures on the other hand we've had things which you know are incredibly whimsical and very sort of you know soft and and cute and cuddly and all that sort of thing uh, and the, all of this of course doesn't mean that these pictures are any less credible it just reflects the fact that people approach these subjects with a different idea in mind and so what this means, I think, for paleo art is that we have to acknowledge that maybe things aren't quite as objective as people like Paul have suggested in the past, and that we can legitimately restore our animals in different ways without leaving the realm of scientific credibility. I think, as others have said, people like Greg Paul are absolutely right that there is a fairly standard way to get us to understanding skeletal anatomy and musculature. Beyond that, we then have to put it into a more subjective process of trying to take that data and restore it into a fully realized animal. And that's where we see most of our variation creeping in. And we have to ask ourselves what this means for scientific accuracy in paleo art. This is something which we are you know, fairly obsessed with, you know, almost in, um, in, in the paleo art world. Does our work conform to scientific understanding? Yeah, and this is something which you post a picture online. If there's something wrong with it, you know, it's, it's almost like you've, uh, you know, you've thrown your picture out for the walls and it gets ripped apart by people. Um, if artwork is out of date, you know, we look at it, we almost ridicule it in some respects. We look at things like the first restorations of dinosaurs in the 1850s, and you know, we kind of go, "Ha! Huh, look how look how bad they were compared to how we understand these animals now." But I actually have some issues with the term accuracy with respect to what we're going for in paleo art. I, I think it suggests that we really have a um, sort of a, a single goal that we can measure all paleo art against. Um, but I don't think that's really the case. Um, we have to acknowledge that we really can't test the majority of assumptions that actually go into our artwork. You know, we're not just talking about things like color. We're talking about soft tissue anatomy. We're talking about behavior. These are things which are really difficult to actually test against the fossil record. We have to acknowledge that we never really know for definite what is going on in deep time. Our understanding of the past is built up on hypotheses and interpretation. It isn't built up on sort of uncovering universal truths. And okay, yes, there are some parts of paleontological science which can, we can be very, very certain about, but compared to the amount of stuff that we're less certain about, the um, you know the, the certain bits are, are rather small indeed. We frequently find ourselves in situations where multiple hypotheses of animal behavior and appearance are simultaneously valid. So that is to say, we have two different, very different ideas which can both seem as correct as each other. And how can that, how can they be accurate if they, we have two very different ideas which are you know, so, so, so conflicting? And so I think what we're really after in paleo art isn't so much accuracy, but credibility. We're looking for artwork which conforms to the best scientific hypotheses of the time, but is not produced under the pretense that it is sort of the definitive version of any particular fossil species. It kind of acknowledges that there are other ideas out there which are maybe just as credible, and that maybe there will be discoveries which overturn the validity of um, of the artwork at some point. But yeah, that's okay because we're only going for credibility at any given time. Not We're not looking to kind of future-proof our work indefinitely. And this is something which I've really run with in recreating an age of reptiles. I, I've, I've thought, well, you know, these are only ever going to be snapshots of these animals. So let's make them as interesting as we can within our current scientific understanding. So this is a case of looking at what people have said about these extinct animals and really trying to run with that. You know, what are the most interesting things that we can do with these animals in paleo art without leaving the scientific realm? So I'm not worried about whether or not in a few years people say Scleromoclus was not a saltating nocturnal reptile because, well, that's what we thought when I drew this. And, uh, you know, there's kind of nothing wrong with, uh, with that idea. You know, I, I can't predict what's going to happen in future, but for the time being, this is a far more interesting view of this animal than just showing it sort of, you know, sat down on a log somewhere in the middle of broad daylight. Uh, likewise with swimming pterosaurs, lots of interesting chats at the minute about could pterosaurs swim or not. Let's embrace that in our art and show them doing interesting things in water. And, um, 
the the result i hope is that the book is actually quite interesting to flip through you know i'm not going to say you know I'm not going to go out there and say you've never seen things like this before it's the most amazing book ever or whatever although if you think that that would be great um but what i mean is that you know hopefully you'll you'll flip through this and think this is a fairly uh, nuanced look at the mesozoic and you know it sort of takes the take the paleo art off the beaten track in uh, in many respects so really that's why um this is an age of reptiles and not the age of reptiles i'm very aware that this is a contemporary you know kind of snapshot of how we m may interpret fossil animals from the mesozoic uh in in art you know things are going to change over time uh, and i'm not worried about that i think it's actually good to view paleo art not as you know a, a sort of a definitive record of of the past but uh, as a more of a record of our interpretations of the past and uh, i think this is something to be really proud of you know within paleontological science we can hold up paleo art as something which is probably unique i think among the sciences as an artistic record of how our hypotheses and interpretations of the past have changed over the last few centuries and you can it's it's such an accessible record everyone can understand this you know they can look at the oldest restorations of mesozoic animals and look at how they compare to the newest ones and they can see just by looking at these pictures how we have you know interpreted and reinterpreted the anatomy and behavior and evolution of these animals um in the last 200 years and so this is something which i've really uh you know really is a main theme of recreating an age of reptiles is that these are snapshots of contemporary thinking not uh, more than they are snapshots of the past and i hope that's really whet your appetite for the kind of discussions that take place in the book so as, as i say you know it's, it's primarily an illustration book but i hope there's some food for thought in there as well um where can you buy a copy um well very soon it's going to be available basically on everywhere uh as i said at the start it's a print on demand book so it's available through the internet only you can't just go into a bookshop and buy it but um it will be available on all the major um bookstore websites you know amazon barnes and noble all that kind of stuff at the minute though you can buy it from lulu.com so lulu the guys who actually print the book they're the print on demand company that i'm using and you can buy it in their shop today you can go and get it right now and lulu is a great place to buy it from because it's actually five percent cheaper than it will be everywhere else so the book is uh, 26 pound ordinarily but it is 2470 on uh, on lulu and uh Without laboring the point too much, the reason it is cheaper on Lulu is because they actually cut a much better deal for creators than people like Amazon and Barnes and Noble, etc. So if you're looking to support artists and to support authors, Lulu is a much better place to buy it than from the mainstream retailers. These online stores are not the only place to buy copies of the book, and particularly if you want a signed copy. And by signed, I don't just mean like my, my signature in there. I can draw a little picture in there for you as well if you want. Um, if you'd like a signed copy, there are two places to grab them. The first one is uh, through my website. So if you go to markwitten.com, there is a, um, a shop on there. There's a, a print books and art gallery. Um, click on there. The books of sale on there. Um, and you can buy signed copies through that. Uh, they're £30, pounds, they're a little bit more expensive than the um, the cover price just because there's a little processing to do at my end which costs a little bit of money before I can send it out to you. Um, the other place to get a signed copy from is if you back me on Patreon. So if you go to my Patreon website, this is a subscription service where you can support um, creative people who work primarily through the internet. If you support me with the right amount of money on Patreon, you can grab a free copy of the book uh, through there. So... There are four places to buy the book, and it really just leaves me to say thanks very much for listening. I hope this uh, little introduction has been, uh, been been of interest, and um, yeah, that that's the book. I hope you enjoy it if you go out to buy it.